We'd like to invite on stage our panelists for the first session, as well as our keynote speaker, Dr. Etere Quintratse, the resident representative in Colombo for the International Monetary Fund, Ms. Anubuti Sahe, head South Asia Economics Research of Standard Chartered Bank in Mumbai, our keynote speaker, Mr. Arun M. Kumar, Chairman and CEO of KPMJ India, Dr. Nishan Dimel, Executive Director of Verite Research, Mr. Asaka Peris, Chief Executive Officer of Singer Sri Lanka PLC, and accompanying them, the Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Rajendra Tiagaraja. So good morning once again, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Just to in, uh, welcome you all once again on behalf of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce for its 18th Sri Lanka Economic Summit being held on the theme on the fast track to a turnaround. Welcoming, all, welcoming you all today is the Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Rajendra Tiagaraja. A very good morning to all of you. On behalf of the leadership of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, let me first extend a warm welcome to all of you to the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2018. This has been organized for the 18th consecutive year, and we take great pride to position this as the signature event in the uh, annual calendar of events of our chamber. This year, the summit will revolve around the theme on a fast track to a turnaround. 2018, to date, has seen a weaker local economic growth, rising global commodity prices, and uncertainty regarding global trade, perhaps also partly fueled by the inwardly looking US economic policies under the Trump administration. Against this backdrop, locally we have been fortunate to achieve the resumption of the GSP plus concession from the European Union, and also seen the first signs of the China Belt and Road initi Initiative centric investments into the country. It is appropriate that we deeply delve into areas such as trade, investment and services that will help turn around our economy while also learning from successful companies and steering reforms of our public sector and bureaucracy to work more effectively to successfully face emerging challenges. During the next two days, a full house in excess of 450 registered participants will benefit from six well-structured thematic sessions with a pool of more than 40 eminent presenters, panelists and moderators from government, policy think tanks and the private sector. We've also recognized the need for urgent public sector reforms to energize the bureaucracy and also dedicated a separate session to bring together six leading chambers to identify common issues of national significance and engage the government with one voice. That will be tomorrow. On Friday afternoon, we had the closing session with the Honorable Ranil Vikram Singh, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, to whom we will present a summary of the key outcomes from each of the six sessions and engage in an interactive panel discussion with the leadership of the Ceylon Chamber. In compiling our findings, we also intend including audience responses to specific session-based issues and questions. Hence your active participation in all sessions and objective opinion feedback via the conference app is extremely important to us. It's now my pleasure to warmly invite Mr. Arun Kumar, CEO of KPMG India and former Assistant Secretary uh, to the US 
entrepreneurs for global markets who will be formally introduced by uh, Savitri to deliver the keynote address after the formal introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tiagaraja, for the welcome and also for taking us through very briefly on what you what to expect in the next two days. Our keynote speaker is chairman and CEO of KPMG in India and is an accomplished global executive with experience spanning multiple sectors from high technology to government and many geographies from Silicon Valley to India. He served as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets and Director General of the US and Foreign Commercial Service in the Obama administration. He led the trade and investment promotion efforts for the US government and served as the International Trade Administration's lead official advocating for better market access to US exporters. Before his tenure in public service, he was a partner and member of the board of directors at KPMG LLP. He led the firm's West Coast management consulting practice, serving major global clients as well as emerging Silicon Valley ventures. He also founded and led KPMG's US India practice. A Silicon Valley entrepreneur and founding CEO and CFO of three technology ventures, he has been a mentor and advisor to a number of new ventures in Silicon Valley and India a member of advisory councils at Stanford University and the University of California, Santa Cruz, an early charter member and board member of TIE Silicon Valley. He has a master's in management from the Sloan School of Management, MIT, and a bachelor's in physics from the University of Kerala in India. Please welcome our keynote speaker and CEO of KPMG India, Mr. Arun Kumar. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Rajendra Tyagaraja, dignitaries, members of the audience, friends. Well, good morning. It, it's a great honor for me to be here, and it's always a pleasure to return to your beautiful country. I will start today, I will share today some observations gained from my time as an official in the Obama administration dealing with trade and investment and then the last, what I've seen in the last 18 months uh, is what's happening in India, just to the north, where I lead, as was mentioned, KPMG. On my first visit here, just a couple of years ago, representing the US administration when I served in Washington, I related an episode of trade from Sri Lanka's history. Ice used to be cut from the frozen lakes of New England, significantly from Walden Pond outside Boston. The ice was covered with salt and sawdust to lower the melting point, and then would be shipped out to Sri Lanka and India. On the return voyage from Sri Lanka, the ships would carry graphite, which would then be used in lead pencils that American school children would write with. So Walden Pond, as you know, became famous when Henry David Thoreau, the philosopher, wrote his book, Walden. It turns out that Thoreau himself worked in his family's pencil factory, shaping Sri Lankan graphite into pencils. This is, to my mind, a story of connections, the connections we find in our world. Everyone and every country is connected in some way. No man is an island, said John Donne, the English poet. We are all connected with one another. And this applies not just to people. It applies equally to an island nation. In today's world, more than ever before, we need to be connected, ideally with open economies operating according to common rules. This connectivity has perforce to be at the center of any economic strategy in today's world and applies even more to Sri Lanka given its geographic situation. Eight years after the end of a long civil unrest, the Sri Lankan economy has grown on average at a rate of 5.8% per year. While there have been signs of a slowdown in the last uh, three from a peak of 8% in 2009 to 3.1% in 2017, there are many indicators to suggest that things do look bright from here on. There are a few matters to keep in mind when we discuss what needs to be done. In the 70s and 80s, investment in the tradable sectors led the productivity boost. Post the Civil War, investment was mainly driven by mega-scale public finance infrastructure projects and did not seem to result in immediate productivity gains as because reforms to enable the business environment lagged. Sri Lanka's static export structure signifies an absence of competitive forces to drive trade dynamism, innovation, and diversification. 
For over two decades, exports have remained concentrated on garments, tea, and rubber products with a declining share in global trade. Introduction of para tariffs barriers during the last decade has effectively doubled the protection rate, making the present trade regime one of the most complex and protectionist in the world. Despite operating a complex and expensive system of tax incentives to promote investment, FDI remains low. However, over the last couple of years, efforts are being made to transition the economy from a predominantly rural-based economy towards a more urbanized one oriented towards manufacturing and services. To that end, Sri Lanka's new Vision 2025 sets out a course of reforms to make the country more competitive and lift the country's standards of living. Structural weaknesses, limited export performance, constrained public finances, and regulatory barriers to investment are some of the macroeconomic issues which have impacted growth over the years. So, what are the aspects to be considered? Let me discuss five topics that are interconnected. First, trade, especially exports. With a domestic market of only 20 million consumers and a modest per capita income, Sri Lanka needs an aggressive external trade policy to fuel its resurgence. External trade is critical to small countries and to large countries. When you are a small country, the challenge is that it is not possible to build prosperity just with a small market. Whether it is Sweden with half the population of Sri Lanka or South Korea with two and a half times the population, it is clear that exports are critical to growth and prosperity. I can tell you that in the United States, the largest economy in the world, where I served as President Obama's lead official to increase exports and inward investment, we saw exports as critical to the growth of employment. Trade is thus one of the most critical reform areas to be addressed on the path to a turnaround. Regional integration is a key element to facilitate such trade. Second, investment, especially FDI. There is an urgent need to catalyze domestic investment and attract FDI in order to grow and create more jobs. Sri Lanka attracts a much lower volume of FDI than peer economies. Sri Lanka can take a leaf from India's book. There, a liberalized FDI regime with automatic approvals, with some exceptions, has resulted in India becoming a prime destination globally for FDI. Third, connectivity, policies and, in, and investments to promote regional cooperation and integration should be a key strategic priority. Such integration should extend to energy, logistics, transportation, communications, and harmonized standards. Fourth, investment in growth-oriented infrastructure and logistics is imperative, imperative to make Sri Lanka an economic hub in South Asia. Finally, balancing geopolitical partnerships, specifically with those, those with China and India. First, let me talk about trade. External trade is imperative for Sri Lanka to achieve high growth, as I just mentioned. External trade depends on being competitive. According to trade policy indicators recently developed by IMF, Sri Lanka's trade and FDI regimes are more restrictive than the average emerging markets across key areas. These restrictive policies translate into weakness in trade competitiveness. In particular, the country is more distant from the emerging market average in the categories of trade facilitation performance and ease of starting a business. Instead, in both areas, Sri Lanka should aim to do very well. The World Economic Forum's Enabling Trade Index 2016 scores Sri Lanka at 4.1 out of 7 due to market access, tariff rates, and tariffs faced in destination markets. An abundance of literate labor is a major asset and has got to be the basis of Sri Lanka's comparative advantage and trade. In such a scenario, where such talent should be applied to creating competitive value-added products for export, protectionist policies will weaken competitive impulses and lower trade. One only has to look north to India's experience, where, after the opening up of the economy in 1991, trade increased and economic growth and per capita income surged. The rationale for economic openness in Sri Lanka is therefore compelling. Back in, 2020, back in 2005, trade accounted for close to 80% of GDP, 
today it hovers around 50%, which is the same as India, but India has a large domestic market. Compare Sri Lanka to some other leading regional economies that are doing well. Vietnam's trade to GDP ratio is now 170%. Malaysia's is 150% and Thailand's is 120%. Of course, Singapore is an outlier at 350%. But these figures all indicate the degree to which trade drives growth in those economies. Moreover, a significantly high state participation in the economy has had implications on competitiveness in a number of sectors and labor market dynamics. In addition to, addition to mastering trade, the country also needs a more diversified export basket beyond garments and cash crops and foreign investment into the more productive manufacturing and services sectors that are linked to global value chains. And these should be not just with the US and Europe, where the bulk of Sri Lanka's trade is directed today, 45% of exports. This is largely due to the preferential access that Sri Lankan exports get in these markets through the generalized system of preferences. The GSP should not become a long-term dependency. It is important to become competitive without the support of the GSP. Furthermore, the GSP itself should have encouraged Sri Lanka to see greater preferential access in other markets by striking trade deals. But surprisingly, Sri Lanka's FDA dossier is limited to only six bilateral deals. One that's been completed with Singapore and then the ongoing negotiations with India, Pakistan, Israel, Iran, and Egypt. So this leaves a vast untapped potential in the neighborhood, including what can be achieved by creating comprehensive links with what is today the third or fifth largest market in the world, depending on how you measure it, and that is India. India has a one, is now a $2.5 trillion economy and has just surpassed the UK in terms of its size. And I can tell you that after spending the last 18 months in India, I see it as an opportunity-rich environment. In fact, I tell, my, tell people in the US that I have not seen uh, an a place with such opportunities as India has today. It compares only with what I used to see during the dot-com days in Silicon Valley back uh, 20, 25, 28 years ago. So there's a lot of potential in, in, in having India in your sights. So clearly, putting all this together, Sri Lanka has a lot of work to do in the area of trade. In order for an economy the size of Sri Lanka to be able to generate and sustain economic growth, inward investments and lowering of barriers to competition in key domestic sectors will be important. The new trade policy approved in July 2017 aims to stimulate growth by improving the ability of firms to export and to compete in the domestic market through a modern, liberal, simple, transparent, and predictable trade regime. And let me share some observations on this. It is critical to recognize the importance of trade capacity building. According to the economic census, 99% of all establishments in the country are micro, small, and medium enterprises. Enabling the SME segment to export in global value chains by helping increase the ability to compete in export markets is a fundamental step. The legal system has to be modernized. Countries like the UK, US, Canada, Australia, Singapore, and now India have successfully incorporated alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, ADRs, into their legal systems. Legislation should be enacted to empower judges to vigorously encourage civil litigants to resolve their disputes using these alternate mechanisms through channels like mediation, negotiation, arbitration, and reconciliation. Training opportunities should be created for those who are interested to learn the, to learn the skills necessary to serve as ADR professionals. Developing adequate compliance infrastructure is also a requirement. Strong commercial law and intellectual property protection mechanisms, especially in the above areas, are incredibly important for improving the ease of doing business. This will in turn increase FDI and smoothen operations for local companies. Sri Lanka can, of course, also look towards working with development institutions like the UNIDO, the ADB, the World Bank for assistance. The revival of Sri Lanka's cinnamon trade in terms of market share, redefining standards and competitiveness is a good example of the results of such past assistance. Sri Lanka has had its share of successes. The government's role in promoting and orchestrating the tourism sector, especially in the areas of price competitiveness and safety is an example. 
trade facilitation measures such as a single electronic window will help reduce transaction costs of the cross-border movement of goods, thereby enhancing trade competitiveness of the economy. Such measures will most importantly also lead to better integrating Sri Lanka into the region. Improving physical connectivity between South and Southeast Asia has long been recognized as a key element in promoting greater trade and investment linkages within the region. In India, Prime Minister Modi has stated that a nation's fortunes are linked to its neighborhood. No nation is too large to not need her neighbors. Measured by intra-regional trade in goods, capital, and ideas, South Asia is the least integrated region in the world. Intra-regional trade as a share of total trade is the lowest for South Asia. The flow of ideas, crudely measured by the cross-border movement of people, or the number of telephone calls, or the purchase of technology and royalty payments are all low for South Asia. So, while South Asia has made significant progress in integrating with the global economy, integration within the region remains limited, primarily due to fears emanating from the varying size of economies. Sri Lanka can play a leading role in changing this. Both India and Sri Lanka are members of SARC, the Indian subcontinent's equivalent of ASEAN, which offers tariff reductions between members. While this regional initiative has seen some progress, a lot more can be done. There are already powerful examples in Asia that show us that differences in size is no constraint to beneficial partnerships if they use each country's strengths depending on the opportunities. As an island economy, Sri Lanka's regional connectivity has been mainly through its seaport in Colombo, a transshipment hub for South Asia. To expand capacity, the country must engage private investments in infrastructure by strengthening the country's institutional and regulatory environment. Active participation in SARC, which I mentioned, the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation called BIMSTEC, and the South Asia Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation Group, SESEC, can all help build further connectivity with neighboring countries and the rest of Asia. Moving on to foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment needs to be a high priority area for growth and employment. India has set an example in the neighborhood. With progressive FDI policies and an activist approach to inviting investment, India has become one of the largest destinations of foreign investment. When I served in the Obama administration, I also had oversight of a unit called Select USA, the, the federal government's investment promotion organization. A country as economically vigorous as the US still recognizes the value of foreign investment for job creation and advancing competitiveness. <coughs> Sri Lanka's foreign investment has remained low, below, has below 2% of GDP over the past 20 years. In addition, new FDI in the past few years has been predominantly infrastructure oriented with only a relatively small proportion reaching sectors that are associated with global value chains. Private sector investment has remained constrained because of the business environment has not been conducive and the public sector has played a dominant role. Since the government's budgetary resources are limited, the private sector is expected to play a larger role in infrastructure development through PPPs, as we see in India. Policies to improve the investment climate, complemented by upgrades in the quality of infrastructure and human resources, need urgent attention to catalyze domestic investment and attract FDI. Breaking from the past, Sri Lanka's new Inland Revenue Act, approved in October 2017, aims for a transparent, unified, and even-handed legal framework. Consistent implementation of this new rule-based system could help unlock long-term investment decisions. More generally, it is vital to cut the red tape hampering businesses to attract greater FDI from various countries. KPMG India has worked extensively with the governments of various states in India in the area of investment promotion. Sri Lanka could adopt best practices from the various states in India from their investment promotion boards to restructure Sri Lanka's board of investment towards purely promoting FDI and away from regulating FDI and managing export processing zones. The work involved in promoting FDI has many dimensions. 
For example, in India, KPMG has undertaken extensive work with respect to development strategy. For example, again, in the IT, ITES sector for the state of Uttar Pradesh to articulate the IT policy of that state. We have done potential market potential studies to promote investment in the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor. We have created a roadmap and helped develop a vision for infrastructure development in various sectors in the Punjab and so on. Ease of doing business is increasingly a key diagnostic parameter for global investors today. In India, KPMG has been working actively with the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, as well as with many states to help measure and improve the ease of doing business. India, as you would all know, made a remarkable improvement in its ease of doing business rankings this year by 30 paces, moving up from 130 to 100. This jump was driven by improvement in many parameters, like construction permits, paying taxes, and insolvency resolution. Most importantly, it is the relentless implementation and on-ground results that made all the difference in India. Sri Lanka also is on a similar path, with the government having fast-tracked the progress of many business-friendly reforms with the aim of moving 20 notches up in the World Bank's ease of doing business for 2019 from the 111th slot that Sri Lanka occupies today. Along with easing, ease of doing business, combating corruption and unfair market practices should be at the heart of the, the efforts of the government. To this end, Sri Lanka should have a strong national framework for public services complaints. There are many good examples to pick from. Uh, Indonesia, for example, has a public complaints unit called LEPOR, which uh, has turned out to be very effective. Let me now move to the fourth point, which is on infrastructure. Sri Lanka has been successful in developing basic infrastructure. It is the highest road density in South Asia. 98% of its population has access to electricity, 96% to safe water, and 95% to sanitation. But Sri Lanka ranks a relatively low 73 out of 138 countries for in infrastructure development in the Global Competitive Index 2016-2017. Thus, given its aggressive ambitions, there is a requirement to further invest in growth-oriented infrastructure like energy, transport, and urban development. During the period 2018 to 2022, infrastructure investment needs are estimated to be five to six billion dollars a year to attain the government's economic growth targets. The capacity of the government to increase infrastructure investments is currently constrained, of course, by a difficult fiscal situation. It is notable in this context that Sri Lanka is focused on this area with support from multinational, multilateral development banks like the ADB to improve road, port, and railway connectivity. Further, there's a dire need, as in India and many developing countries, to leapfrog over decades-old infrastructure and modernize the energy sector by investing in smart grids, efficient technologies, and mobile apps for electricity payments. Today, Asia invests $880 billion in infrastructure overall, which is barely half of what is needed. Over the next, 25, over the next 15 years, this need is estimated to be four times the current investment. Adequate infrastructure is not only necessary for accelerating economic growth, but is also a prerequisite to achieve better health, education, and other development outcomes. Fiscal reforms to enhance sustainability of government finances and public infrastructure investments need to continue. There is also a requirement to create a governance mechanism to implement projects successfully. Legal frameworks, regulatory policies, and strengthening the overall policy environment is imperative. Engagement with private sector to boost efficiency of infrastructure services can also, should also be explored. These reforms will ultimately enhance Sri Lanka's ability to address border and behind the border barriers for cross-border collaboration infrastructure, example, the harmonizing of regulatory standards. Staying on the topic of beyond the border connectivity, a free and open Indian Ocean is at the core of the emerging Indo-Pacific view of the world. The Indo-Pacific paradigm recognizes deepened connections between the Indian Ocean region and the Pacific, from the shores of Africa all the way to the west coast of the Americas. Sri Lanka is physically a veritable attractive diadem in this picture of the Indo-Pacific. Many countries, notably China, India, and Japan, 
are seeking a greater role in developing Sri Lanka's strategic location between the energy-rich Middle East, Africa, and the Straits of Malacca. The US, too, is not far from considering Sri Lanka as a strategic bulwark. Sri Lanka, no doubt, would want to make the best of its attractive location by fashioning itself as a potential trade and finance hub open to doing business with everyone, thus taking it closer to its economic vision. But, of course, it would be a delicate balancing game. Historically, Sri Lanka has had close relations with China, stretching for a couple of thousand years, and seeking to renew those connections would seem to be the natural thing to do. The recent expansion of China's economic and military reach has caught international interest, given China's principle of active defense and the history of acting in self-interest. Sri Lanka should, of course, be fully conscious of this. Access to an industrial park in Sri Lanka and the management of the hub and Tota deep sea port at the international airport are recent signs of China asserting itself at the international high table. It is also an indication of Chinese designs to build influence by creating logistics bases globally and alongside securing access to strategic resources. Port City Colombo, financed by China, promises to be a game changer for Sri Lanka and the government hopes its development will, will help Colombo become an enhanced trading hub between Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. The port will also be a finance center accessing the Indian subcontinent's rapidly developing markets, attracting overseas investors and increasing employment. Given that large economies in Asia, such as India and Japan, cannot fund Sri Lanka's large infrastructure needs fully, Sri Lanka has looked to cooperate more closely with China. But several times, this easy money which is offered comes with strings attached, which could be unsustainable debt, as has been in the news lately. Decreased transparency, restrictions on market economics, and a loss of control over natural resources. Internationally, the Bridge and Road Initiative into the designs of which Sri Lanka falls has been viewed with suspicion that the global investment and lending program amounts to a debt trap for vulnerable countries around the world, fueling corruption and autocratic behavior in struggling countries. It is important in this context for Sri Lanka to take a well-informed approach to also engage with the rest of the economies in the region, finalizing free trade agreements with many of the major regional powers over the next year or so would be desirable as balancing and enhancing measures. Among these are the economic and technology cooperative agreements, agreement with India and FTAs with other countries. The Sri Lankan government's turn towards broader engagement with East Asia recognizes the country's pivotal position as a strategic asset related connecting with both India and China. Asia and the world will have a better future when the large economies work together, being sensitive to each other's interests. What would it take for Sri Lanka to be that Switzerland of Asia where the major countries work together? India is, of course, Sri Lanka's closest neighbor. The relations between the two countries is more than 2,500 years old, and both sides have built upon a legacy of intellectual, cultural, religious, and linguistic intercourse. In addition to the historical connections with India of Hinduism, of Buddhism, Sri Lanka also has had an ethnic Tamil diaspora that has deep linkages with Indian people in the state of Tamil Nadu. Many Indian origin diaspora have resided in its southern neighbor for decades now. They, in fact, form an important link between the Indian and Sri Lankan people and the government. But most importantly, as I mentioned, the dynamic economy in India today should be very, very attractive as a, as, as a source of growth for Sri Lanka. By virtue of its proximity, India is a natural trading partner. Should the tiny island state need any assistance, India is close at hand. So India is well positioned both strategically and market-wise, and I would say most importantly market-wise, because as I said earlier, the market in India today is just booming. Both countries are democracies. The relations between both countries have matured and diversified with the passage of time, encompassing all areas of contemporary relevance and the extensive people-to-people -people interaction of their citizens. So the India-Sri Lanka relationship is multifaceted. Sri Lanka has gone through defining transitions over the past decade. Despite significant productivity growth in the post-war period, it has been challenging for Sri Lanka to diversify exports 
and get its share in global trade, which has been declining gradually. Unlike its East Asian neighbors, Sri Lanka's export structure has been static for years, reflecting a lack of competitive forces to drive trade dynamism, innovation, and diversification. When I interact with investors and trade delegations from around the world, overwhelmingly Sri Lanka's geographic location and access to regional markets are cited as top reasons for their interest in the country's economy. Sitting in the middle of the Indian Ocean, off the southern tip of India, Sri Lanka occupies an enviable strategic position, a blessing that with careful and thoughtful handling and long-term vision and a commitment to openness can be leveraged to its advantage. Leveraging the island's geostrategic position can be a game changer for economic growth. Reforms to, to ease the business environment and trade, now at the early stages of implementation, can become catalysts and enablers for accelerated growth. Other countries that have pursued infrastructure scale-up have learned that business environment liberalization is also required for private sector-led growth. To this end, the current economic environment offers a window of opportunity for evaluating structural weaknesses and working towards enhancing competitiveness. Clearly, the Sri Lankan government is focused on making the country more open to the world and becoming an attractive place to do business. The key, as we have seen in India, is that the leadership should place relentless focus on execution. Sustained commitment and follow through will be required to see that reform succeed. Once again, I thank the members of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce for giving me this opportunity to be here. Thank you. Deeply insightful and penetratingly perceptive, that keynote address came to you on a platform of a wealth of knowledge and information and experience from our keynote speaker, which we should be taking much advantage of in the next panel session. We would now be concluding our inauguration and moving on to session one immediately. I would like to um, invite Mr. Rajendra Tiagaraja while saying thank you to him to please step down while we invite our moderator, Shiran Fernando, Chief Economist of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, to continue this next session, our first session, technical session. Um, I'd also like to in, uh, welcome very warmly one of the panelists or, uh, who will be, who joined this uh, session of this first session, the State Minister of Finance and Mass Media, the Honorable Eran Vikramaratna. A token of appreciation to Mr. Kumar for his very insightful keynote address. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session at the Sri Lanka Economic Summit. Staying true to the theme of on the fast track to a turnaround, we are tackling that issue by first looking at a macro level. Where is the economy heading towards? And um, I think as, as elaborated by the chairman as well as our keynote speaker, um, and it's often said, we live in interesting times, and this period is no different. Um, we're in the backdrop of beyond what's going on domestically, externally we're seeing a lot of um, changes in terms of where interest rates are going, the global trade growth momentum which was there from 2017 is seeing a bit of a blip. Uh, we are getting uh, mixed signals in terms of where commodities are going and all this is impacting Sri Lanka as it looks to push through some reforms through, get growth back on track and make sure that uh, prosperity is um, enjoyed by, by the masses. So I think we have with us a very eminent panel. Um, and if generally we do have economists talking about uh, um, on, on an economic turnaround, but we have four economists to be uh, precise. We have an economist who is now a politician, uh, Minister Iran. We have an economist um, who was previously a minister who is now with the IMF and is the IMF resident uh, representative, Dr. Eteri. We have, uh, from, um, from an investment background, um, uh, who's here with us as well, Ms. Anubuti Sahe from Standard Charter Bank. And we have, uh, to round off the economists, we have uh, Dr. Nishan, who is 
uh, part of a leading think tank who leads, who's the executive director of a leading think tank, Verite Research. And into that mix, we have the thoughts and vis um, ideas from our keynote speaker. And to round it off, we have the private sector view uh, from a personality who is very well known in the corporate circles, uh, Mr. Asokapiris. So I think how we will go about this is uh, Anubuti will uh, kickstart with her presentation uh, for about 15 minutes, touching on, on the global uh, dynamics and its relation to Sri Lanka. Dr. Terry will pick it up from there and move in into the local implications. And Minister uh, Iran will then um, examine, I guess, both uh, presentations, give his perspectives and the policy drive towards it. And then we'll start off with our panel discussion. I'd encourage you to download the app if you have not already. There are two things in particular to do. Uh, there are questions that you can ask in the Q&A session because we want to make it as interactive as possible. Less questions from me, more questions from you, the better. Um, so download the app. The session which is happening now is session one. You can go into that session, um, click on the questions, ask the speaker questions, ask your questions, and then there's also polls that are also going on which will also add to the discussion and into the end presentation that we're hoping to make as mentioned by the chairman. Um, so Anubuti, the flow is, is yours. Uh, very good morning to everyone. And uh, in the next 15 minutes, I will be uh, discussing few important global themes and what it means uh, for Sri Lanka in uh, specific and how Sri Lanka can navigate through it. Uh, as uh, Shiran was mentioning, we live in interesting times. But when times are interesting, uncertainty is also very high. So we live in interesting as well as very uncertain times as changes around us unravel themselves in the most unexpected manner. And it's important to acknowledge that these changes, these uncertainties, and risks associated with these changes will persist for years, if not for decades. And therefore, every single economy, including Sri Lanka, will have to navigate through tough economic environment going forward. It is thus necessary that we assess what the risks are, you know, what are the likely sources of risks, so that we can manage them very, very effectively in order to unlock the existing opportunities as well as to find new ones. So in that uh, broader backdrop, I would like to flag three specific major shifts which are happening in the global economy as we speak, what it means for the economy, you know, the global economy at large, and Sri Lanka in specific, and very briefly touch upon how Sri Lanka can navigate through these changes. So coming to the first major shift, you know, that shift is related to a two-dimensional change in the monetary policy of advanced economies. As we all very well know that after global financial crisis, in order to support the growth story, in order to support the markets, major central banks pursued an excessively, or we can say an ultra-loose monetary policy. But now they are trying to normalize it by raising rates, and by reducing liquidity in the overall global markets. In fact, if you look at the Federal Reserve, you know, the Central Bank of the United States, they have hiked rates by 150 basis points. I mean, their rates were very close to zero just, uh, you know, two years back. They have raised rates by 150 basis points since 2016. And in our view, according to Standard Chartered, given the strong growth in U.S., though it comes on back of a sugar rush of, uh, you know, st fiscal stimulus, we think they are on a track to go and raise rates by four more times from here till mid of 2019. Not only are they raising rates, but they have actually started taking out liquidity from the global markets. The other major central bank, uh, European Central Bank or ECB, is not hiking rates. We think they are still far away from hiking rates. Maybe it's more a story of second half of 2019 than 2018 itself, but they are on a well-telegraphed path 
to bring an end to their liquidity injection plan by end of 2018. You know, I'm talking a lot about liquidity, you know, why it is important, uh, and especially for emerging markets. I guess it becomes, uh, the point becomes, uh, you know, um, uh, becomes more prominent if we focus on this particular chart. Now, what the blue shaded area primarily reflects is the amount of liquidity injection which these major central banks, that is Federal Reserve, ECB, BOE, and BOJ, have done over past, you know, since the uh, global financial crisis. And if you focus on this area, which is, you know, 2016 and 2017, you can clearly see that these central banks, all these four major central banks, injected $2 trillion, $2 trillion on an annual basis to keep market supported, to keep growth supported. It definitely helped, uh, and emerging markets, developing economies, Sri Lanka, everyone benefited uh, from the ample liquidity. But now these central banks, as they are pushing back, this liquidity injection has already halved in 2018 and will drop to zero. So if you look at this jump point, it will drop to zero in 2019. So the shift is massive, the magnitude is great, and it is inevitable that it will have a massive impact on interest rates across the world, not only in Sri Lanka, across the world. It will have massive impact on FX, currencies are likely to stay under pressure, and there will be increased financial volatility. Higher oil prices are not helping much. What further complicates is the second big shift, which is to do with rising protectionism, I mean, to be fair, protectionism is not a new phenomenon. We have been seeing it across the world. It has been a story for the past few years. But probably 2018 stands out because the escalation in trade tension between US and China took all of us by surprise. And it's inevitable that if, it, if these trade tensions actually culminate into a trade war, it will have massive impact on global economy. It's difficult to quantify it. I can't give you a number to say, okay, if we end up in a period of trade war, we will get uh, so much of loss in uh, global growth. But probably just to get some sense, we did some economic analysis, we did some uh, econometric analysis, and looked at the extreme case where if US bans all import from China, U.S. economy, uh, economic loss in our view would be close to 1% of GDP. I mean, it's not a small loss because U.S. is a $19 trillion economy. For China, the loss is likely to be, you know, more than 3% of GDP. Again, it's not a small amount because China is close to 12 to $13 trillion economy. So we are talking about big numbers here, difficult to give one big uh, uh, you know, a comprehensive number, but every single economy, US, China, here we have got a whole list of economies which are likely to lose in case of trade tensions, in case trade tensions actually escalate into a trade war, but losses will be massive. And I think if we look at the immediate part, if we are looking at 2018 and if we are looking at 2019, I think more than the impact on the real economy, uh, you know, because we think that real economy impact will come with much of a lag, the bigger round of risk is primarily going to come through financial markets, through loss of economic, uh, you know, through loss of uh, confidence. And that will put further pressure on currencies and will create a lot more problems for policymakers in the rest of the world. What does this uh, you know, uh, all mean for economies like Sri Lanka? I mean, uh, in this kind of an environment where risk aversion is massive, foreign money is very, very difficult to get. So economies, like say India, if I take the example of India, which run a twin deficit, you know, you run a current account deficit, you run a fiscal deficit, you need foreign money to just to pay for your, say, import bill. These economies get hurt the most. And in that context, Lung Sri Lanka actually is, on, uh, is, is in a vulnerable position. It runs a current account deficit, it runs a fiscal deficit. So that makes it uh, you know, vulnerable and uh, that makes it important that more measures are taken in order to reduce the vulnerability on this account. Not to miss out, 
50, more than 50% of fiscal deficit is nowadays getting financed through foreign inflows. And if the environment globally remains tough, uh, this funding can come at a very, very expensive uh, price. There is a huge amount of debt redemption, redemptions bunched up between 2018 and 2022. Sri Lanka imports huge amount of uh, its fuel uh, from the rest of the world. So putting it all together, uh, there, are, there are various points of vulnerabilities. And while I would not like to get into the numbers, but all these factors, I mean, if Sri Lankan rupee depreciates by say 5%, or if say crude oil increases, prices increase by $10, it will mean that inflation will move higher fiscal deficit and current account deficit will turn much wider and growth can suffer. So it's, 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 it's likely to be a tough uh, uh, you know, environment uh, going uh, forward on back of these vulnerabilities. Touching on the third big shift, uh, which is happening in the global economy, is about productivity gains. It might not uh, seem very relevant in the immediate context, but as policy makers, one has to think not only about today, but for decades to come. In the first chart, what we show is that since global financial crisis, productivity growth has slowed down dramatically. Now, why productivity matters? It's an economist term, we talk a lot about it. It matters because slower productivity gains constrain growth. It has the potential to stagnate living standards. It has the potential to create social fissures and therefore you know, lead us to political pressures. Uh, we are not uh, unfamiliar with this kind of a scenario. Look around the world, especially look in the developed uh, economies, and we have seen what voters have gone for if inequalities, if growth, uh, inequalities increase and growth doesn't happen. So this is one area where policymakers, not only in Sri Lanka, but across the world, have to take care of, not from today's perspective, but for next few decades to come through. Uh, how Sri Lanka fares in this particular aspect? I would say uh, it, Sri Lanka, especially in the South Asian context, is uh, Fair, you know, like it's, it's definitely at, in a much more insulated uh, space. The human development indicators are far better and probably where even, you know, like you know, countries like India would really aspire to reach at that uh, particular point. The per capita income is high, uh, inequality levels are low. So to that extent, it helps. But if we look at uh, the, comp the, the change in competitiveness over the past few years, there are reasons to stay concerned. We did an interesting analysis. What we did was we look, looked at Global Competitiveness Index, uh, which ranks you know, a lot of economies, and we focused especially on the Asian economies and what we observed that between 2008 and 2017-18, you know, the economy in Asia which lost maximum number of ranks was Sri Lanka. Because of the slower pace of reforms, it lost on most of the uh, pillars and therefore there is a need to do a lot more catch up because it was in a far better position a decade uh, back. So in a nutshell, lot of risks lingering in the global horizon which will have implications for Sri Lanka and will complicate uh, pol pol policy choices. So, but the good news is that the government has already initiated the corrective measures under, uh, of course, with the support of uh, multi international organizations like IMF. And its efforts towards enhancing or moving towards narrower fiscal deficit by enhancing revenues and not by cutting expenditure is definitely noteworthy. It, recent measures to link fuel prices to market prices is another important uh, uh, point. And we think more measures which finally make CBSL uh, an inflation targeting central bank by 2020 can be other key milestones. But as the first speaker mentioned, uh, it, you know, a lot more needs to be done. And again, nothing very specific to Sri Lanka. Macro stability 
and sustaining growth is always an ongoing process. And that is something which Sri Lanka will have to go, will have to go and do, not only for this year, but for many more years to come ahead. Our keynote speaker spoke at length about what Sri Lanka needs to do, and therefore I will not get into uh, those details, but probably just you know, club them as a three-pronged approach. Sri Lanka needs to diversify, whether it is a diversification away from public sector-led growth to private sector-led growth, whether it is diversification of exports destination, export basket, or for that matter, even bringing in more female laborers in uh, the labor force rather, you know, in order to gain more productivity gains. The second thing which Sri Lanka should uh, focus on or should be uh, the policy approach is to leverage leverage on its own strength. Sri Lanka has an enviable, enviable uh, ranking when it comes to human development indicators. It needs to leverage on its education, educated and healthy workforce, needs to build in more business uh, outsourcing uh, units. It's surprising to me when I get to hear that a lot of companies across the world are actually opening up of, you know, uh, back office operations or business processing operations in countries as far as Poland, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, in my view, should be the top choice uh, there. Even when it comes, given its educated uh, force, when it comes to high level R&D, you know, Sri Lanka definitely offers a massive opportunity uh, there. The third part is to do with streamline and stabilize. You know, bureaucracy, simplifying the legal framework, providing a more conducive environment for private sector to grow, linking uh, you know, the various uh, parts of the economy are crucial to attain macro stability and to realize the potential of the economy. To conclude, I would say that reforms, if you look around, look around the history, reforms in most of the countries have never taken in good times. They are always taken in the most difficult times. And probably that gives me a, a lot of hope, not only for Sri Lanka, but for the, you know, a lot of countries, including India, that things will move in the right direction because now we are not left with too many choices or because now we are not spoiled with choices. So thanks a lot. And now I'll pass it on to the next speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Anubhuti, for those insightful remarks. I think uh, she left us with three main areas in terms of diversification, leveraging, and also then uh, went on to highlight uh, what uh, we need to do in terms of identifying reforms and this stage in terms of the, in terms of the turnaround, looking at the risk in terms of opportunity. Um, so with that, we'll move now to our second speaker, Dr. Terry. the floor is now yours. Um, thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you, previous speakers, for a very interesting overview of uh, global challenges as some of the reform priorities that uh, Sri Lanka could take uh, upon itself. In my presentation, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, some of the regional context, and then I'll move into Sri Lanka specific uh, reform priorities. Um, good news is that Asia is still the uh, fastest growing region of the world and the global growth contribution of Asia remains the highest. But as previous speaker uh, said, the uh, world is becoming increasingly uncertain place uh, with many risks uh, playing at the same time. Asia uh, remains the fastest growing region, but Asia is aging, productivity is slowing, Inequality is increasing and trade wars threaten economic gains um, from past decades. Uh, we had also recent episodes of capital outflows in, in emerging markets which led uh, many Asian currencies to depreciate. Um, I think one important aspect uh, in terms of um, structural context to keep in mind is also that Asia is aging fast and actually its fastest growing regions are aging at a higher speed than other countries 
Uh, and um, Asia is at risk of uh, getting old before it actually gets rich. And if we look at Sri Lanka, uh, in its aging profile, Sri Lanka is closer to East Asian neighbors, but in terms of uh, development uh, gains and uh, gross potential reached, there is a lot of um, uh, steps that Sri Lanka needs to take. Um, why aging is important? Because as economies age, it uh, puts additional drag on the productivity. So effectively, you have to do more dramatic reforms to be able to gain higher growth potential. Second uh, structural issue I want to highlight, which previous uh, speakers also spoke at length, is uh, impact of trade on the growth potential. And as you could see on these two charts, Asia became highly integrated in global trade in past two decades, and gains uh, of, uh, from trade uh, were substantial. Any escalation of trade tensions obviously threatens these trade linkages and supply chains, which may have negative implications uh, for growth. Uh, and all this is happening in the context of uh, U.S. normalization or, and uh, tightening uh, conditions, uh, which uh, affect uh, capital outflows from emerging uh, markets and, and expectations, uh, as previous speakers were saying, are, uh, are uh, with higher funding costs and weaker currencies uh, in Asia. In this challenging global environment, um, Countries which have twin deficits, um, like Sri Lanka, uh, are most vulnerable. So Sri Lanka has uh, high debt and low revenues. And uh, as past episodes of um, worsening global environment showed, if Sri Lanka continues on the path of fiscal consolidation and maintains consistently and persistently reform efforts which were underway in past couple of years, investor confidence could actually strengthen and remain with Sri Lanka. Second aspect of vulnerability for Sri Lanka is obviously current account deficit, low reserve position, high debt rollover requirements, and to uh, manage those vulnerabilities, obviously Sri Lanka needs to maintain adequate reserve cover and strengthen its reserve position further and has to deal with external shocks with more, foreign, with more exchange rate flexibility. In that context, developing comprehensive inflation targeting framework and moving forward with that reform effort is essential. So let me briefly talk about um, uh, extended fund facility supported program of government uh, reforms. Um, extended fund facility was approved uh, in 2016. It's a three-year program in amount of 1.5 billion. One billion has been already dispersed. Program has been performing relatively well, and at this moment, uh, fifth review is being conducted, and one more review remains to complete the program. EFF's objective is to support government's own reform priorities which aim to grow um, country's own resources to meet, meet its own social and development uh, needs. Sri Lanka's uh, key vulnerabilities, as I said, are low revenue, high debt, and low reserve position. Introducing a new uh, broad-based tax system uh, and uh, doing a gradual fiscal consolidation uh, which will be revenue-based, uh, will help to reduce and manage uh, overall debt levels. This has to be supported uh, with inflation targeting framework, with a stronger reserve uh, management and flexible exchange rate, and also transparent and accountability reforms, which should st strengthen economic governance. All these reforms are going to outlive uh, any kind of uh, IMF support program and should lay the foundation for more uh, predictable and stable macroeconomic uh, management framework going forward. Um, to um, 
mention also aspects of inclusiveness and uh, more kind of broad-based uh, development. Obviously, all these gains from revenues or external resources need to be channeled to more productive and inclusive economic activities. In that sense, uh, we see potential to address issues like uh, natural disaster mitigation and management, more active uh, female la labor force participation, and obviously protecting the most vulnerable for better targeted, uh, ta for better targeting uh, social benefits. The most important aspect that which needs to be tackled to unlock uh, Sri Lanka's growth potential is obviously competitiveness. And previous speakers spoke at length about the need to reduce regulatory burden, gradually open up for trade, and compete. Compete globally, compete regionally, move fast in that area because gains are quite large. In as um, also indicating, uh, while impl implementing various structural reforms, obviously macro stability is a key foundation, and those uh, reforms have to continue. Inflation targeting framework has to continue, aimed at gradually reducing inflation, enabling flexible exchange rate regime, improving uh, countries' uh, external reserve cover. Uh, central government uh, fiscal uh, consolidation, revenue-based fiscal consolidation has to also continue to gradually uh, reduce the debt burden. To highlight uh, some of the reforms uh, which country has already implemented, uh, I put up this list uh, just for general re reference. Many reforms are underway. Um, important steps have been taken to putting tax system on more stable and broad-based uh, system to enable future revenue generation capacity. In that sense, reforms in Inland Revenue Act, VAT, were essential. Now all the focus is about uh, implementation through automated and predictable systems. In terms of public financial management, uh, uh, fiscal rule-based uh, consolidation frameworks, predictable public financial management systems are the key. And addressing uh, large state-owned enterprises and managing uh, their debt profiles is also extremely important. In that sense, energy pricing reforms are key parameters. It's a necessary step to be able to contain fiscal costs from state-owned enterprises, but obviously it's not sufficient. More reforms need to be done to actually address cost efficiency of the state-owned enterprises from inside. Um, finally, let me briefly touch on competitiveness. Uh, as, pre as keynote speaker said, uh, Sri Lanka compared to other emerging markets uh, has a more restrictive FDI and uh, trade regulatory environment. And there are huge gains to be made if this environment is more open and uh, less uh, regulated or more predictable. Uh, Sri Lanka's economy lost uh, its trade competitiveness. Um, and actually, as uh, also mentioned here, its trade structure has not changed in past 25 years. It has remained garments and tea and uh, rubber products. Uh, while, for example, East Asian neighbors have moved very fast on export uh, diversification and export uh, value chain. Now, question is why uh, Sri Lanka's export structure has been frozen for past 25 years? And answer is because it's uh, highly protected, highly regulated, and there is no space for competition and innovation. So to enable competition and innovation, you have to have less restrictive and more enabling regulatory environment. Final comment I want to make, um, there is a saying, um, if you don't know where you are going, uh, you will always get there. I think Sri Lanka knows where it's going. It has uh, set out uh, very ambitious objectives to position itself 
as a regional and uh, global hub for trade and development and innovation. It also knows how to get there. I think all the reforms mentioned here have been discussed many times, strategies have been developed, steps have been made to implement those strategies. And when it depends, it depends how consistently and persistently those reforms are implemented and its function of effort that government as well as private sector, civil society of this country puts into this uh, uh, implementation. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Before the Honorable Minister delivers his uh, speech and presentation, uh, let me just remind you once again about the app. Um, please download it if you have not already. Uh, go to session one and where you can click on ask the speaker and put your questions in. We have uh, a couple at the moment, but uh, keep them coming in so that we can have a very interactive session with the panelists. Minister Iran, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning. We have uh, been um, fortunate to listen to Arun Kumar's uh, very incisive uh, analysis um, and also Anubhuti's uh, managing the risk that exists in the environment. And then, of course, uh, what Eteri said, because we have been in constant discussion. Uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, take some of those themes and maybe uh, uh, respond to the themes as well as say what's happening and not happening. I would say, by and large, I agree uh, uh, with particularly the risk analysis that was made this morning. Often we have an idea that somehow or other that government is God and somehow or other government can solve all of our problems, including our economic problems. And I think that it was very clear from today's presentations that the risk environment uh, is uh, global, it's regional, and that Sri Lanka is a small economy within that. And so there are things that we can do and we must do, and then there are other vulnerabilities which we need to be uh, aware of. I was also interested in the risk management presentation. It said, you know, we need to look at managing risk, and some of these risks will be there over a longer period or even over a decade. Now, those of us who come from the private sector are basically looking at the next quarter. That's the problem we fundamentally face. So there are uh, there are great risks. We talked about global uh, major central banks, you know, the curtailing of credit. And if you look at some of the measures that we have taken since 2015 in terms of reform, one of the casualties of that has been the growth rate because of the other fiscal disciplines that have been put in place. Uh, they talked about the China-US trade tension, uh, and uh, you know what it could do, and also Sri Lanka being more vulnerable in a sense because of the twin deficits that the country face. In 2015, the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP was in excess of seven, and we've got it to 5.5, and we are hoping that it will go below uh, five in 2018. We would not divert from that path of fiscal consolidation because we think that we need to uh, look at the vulnerabilities and take a much more long-term perspective. Now, somebody said, and I don't know whether it was Anubhuti in her presentation, policymakers have to think about the decades to come. Politicians think about the next election. <laughs> and uh, this is the, if you want, the conflict that we face, and this is the conflict that uh, we are facing immediately. This is the conflict that the finance minister, Mangala Samaravira, will be grappling with over the next few weeks. Sri Lanka has, over time, unfortunately, made the wrong decision over decades. That's why we started at the same line. 
And then you have countries like Singapore where they are today, and you have countries like Sri Lanka where they are today. It's because of this conflict, and it's not a new conflict, it's a conflict that has existed over a long time. There are two exogenous uh, factors that gen generally impact us greatly. One is the weather, and the other is the fuel prices. Both of over which we don't have too much control. As you know, in 2017, weather impacted us, maybe about 20 districts of our 25 districts had a drought, and then that impact was one of the reasons that we uh, deviated somewhat from our fiscal consolidation because of that exogenous factor. And in the presentation now, also there were numbers quoted and said, if fuel prices go by X, what will actually happen right, uh, uh, to our uh, current account? What will actually happen uh, in terms of the inflationary impact? I must say that uh, given the reforms that we have undertaken, right, we have in 2017, the macroeconomic indicators were doing better. I think everybody will agree, the trade deficit, the, the, the deficit, budget deficit is at least trending down. We'll agree that inflation has been trending down. Reserves have been up, exports have been up, <coughs> and these are good indicators. But these are small numbers, and in a larger global context and a larger global economy, the vulnerabilities do exist. Yeah, Eteri talked about some of the reforms that have been undertaken, uh, and uh, she mentioned, for example, the fuel price reforms that have been undertaken, which was a major step for us, <coughs> because some people say, you know, the government is indecisive, you take one step forward and then one step back. Uh, it's the nature of a coalition government, you see, that sometimes, unlike a single party government, it's a single mandate, which is able to take a unilateral decision. Coalition governments, by their nature, sometimes has a revisitation. And the revisitation comes <coughs> because of lobbies that basically go up and then question it, and then one party in there says, okay, we need to relook at it. This is not acceptable, but this is what actually happens. And I often tell people that you are looking at me and saying, why is it happening? You are to blame. And I turn around and tell them, you are to blame, because that's a mandate you gave us. And we are acting within the mandate that has been given. It's a coalition mandate that actually has been given. Now this situation, the reason I'm saying this is, this situation can continue in the future too, this situation can continue. You look at countries across Europe, there has been a shift. Increasingly, there are coalition governments all over the world because democracies are exercising, uh, exercising itself in particular ways. So this is uh, 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 you know, one of the reasons. Fuel prices, energy reforms, and even you know, uh, things like water. Now, this, this, some of these topics are very sensitive because sometimes people take these things out of context and then they create a negative impression about the country. And that's why uh, I want to say what I'm saying as clearly as possible because sometimes people take things out of context and they quote these things. Uh, recently, uh, I made a comment about the exchange rate and I saw the Reuter reporter had misinterpreted my comments on the exchange rate management and misled the public as a result of it. In my comment, what I meant was the fact that the Ministry of Finance would not intervene in exchange rate management. It's a departure from the past. We believe in an independent central bank. We have given the central bank the space, unlike in the past, right? But that was misreported. And it is independently done by the central bank. I understand that the central bank would intervene as and when necessary to curb excessive volatility in the exchange rate. Central Bank had made a statement about it. Now, I would go further and hope that not only that, the Central Bank will actually punish speculators. So I think that comments sometimes are taken out of context and misrepresented. I was also disturbed to see Namura analysts having misquoted Sri Lanka and putting it on a very high vulnerability scale. And they had said that Sri Lanka's short-term external debt is no, is 160, uh, 160 billion dollars. I don't know where on earth they got such a figure. Even our GDP is not that. 
and uh, 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 I, I mean very uh, unfortunate, erroneous reporting, when I think that figure is probably somewhere around $10 billion and quoting it as $160 billion. So the reason I said this is when you talk openly and frankly about sensitive issues, uh, people sometimes, uh, if you are misquoted, unfortunately it can have a negative impact. This is our economy, this is our country, and as Eteri said, we think we know where it's going, and we will make sure, we will make sure that it goes in that direction. I was in Monoragala just about 10 days ago, and I vis visited some of the poorest villages in this country, the poorest villages. Monoragala is the second poorest district in the country. And I was there, I visited the local temples, even the temples were poor. The economy is poor. Uh, and I asked them, what is the requirement? And they basically said, we need water. They wanted basically their local tanks, and I went to three villages, basically their local tanks uh, rehabilitated. And uh, we, we agreed to do that. In fact, we, 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 we agreed, we took immediate steps in rehabilitating it. We have a, we have a program that's going on. We are rehabilitating 1,200 tanks across the country. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka is a country, we are facing the impacts of global warming, though we are not responsible for it. We are one of the probably 10 most vulnerable countries in terms of environmental disasters, uh, and that's what we are doing. But then, as I opened the shower this morning, and I got under the shower, and I was having my very comfortable shower, I was looking at the water that was actually being expended. As you brush your teeth and you open your tap, the water that is being expended. And when you look at it, you pick the bottle of water, and I came in here, and I was so happy to see that there were no bottles of water, but that the water was actually, you know, in, in, in glass, whatever, you know, vases. So I was happy to see that, but if you really examine, and yesterday I was at a seminar, I took the bottle of water, and I realized that the bottle of water was more expensive than the kerosene that was being given, and a little under the price of diesel that was being given. In 100 years, our forest cover has come down, and this expense has gone on. But the reason I raised it here when we talk about reform, right? But if you talk about reform in water, I think that those of us who are misusing it should be paying for it so that those villages in Monoragala are actually subsidized by those taxes that we take. So when you're looking at reform, there are lots of sensitive issues that we need to look at. But, you know, politicians, we don't want to even talk about them because they are so sensitive and we don't have a decade. We just have a few months before the next election. So, the other major reform issue is really protection versus competition. You see, and this is, uh, 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 this is a highly contentious issue. I'm in a private sector audience. Most people who come to see us generally want their industries protected. But where do we want Sri Lanka to really be? Our exporters, some of them have done extremely well. Our rubber tires are used in the world's top aircrafts. Our surgical gloves are used by the world's best surgeons. Our electronic sensors are used in the world's top car brands. Our pearls are worn by the world's top athletes, and also we are producing some of the world's top brands. Our IT software is used in the world's leading stock markets. So we can compete, we can compete, we must compete. compete. And I think the issue, on, I think Eteri's last uh, slide that she brought up, the issue of competition came up strongly. There is no other way for this country unless we open up and unless we basically are ready to compete. Because our 20 million, 21 million market won't make a huge difference to raise our living standards. We have to access the larger market and we, are, we have to be the gateway to the South Asian market. We have undertaken uh, uh, tax reforms. I won't go into the details, but we will be removing para tariffs over the next period, right? And I know that that will mean competition for a lot, lots of us here, from the airport development levy to, to the cessors, right? We are, we are in going in that direction. We are, as the presenters showed and talked about, including the keynote speaker today, the Inland Revenue Bill, despite all its hiccups in implementation, and I admit that there are hiccups in implementation, it's certainly moving Sri Lanka to a more rules-based system, taking discretion away from politicians and from bureaucrats. Uh, the increasing 
uh, you know, the ease of doing business, much to be done. I accept the criticisms that were made today, much needs to be done. We have a single window uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, basically created to, to facilitate online systems of some regulatory agencies. So far, we have got the National Plan Quarantine Service, the System of Department of Animal Production and Health, and the Sri Lanka Standards Institute on it. So you, we've got all that in one place, and we have also got a trade portal going. I think this is all ongoing uh, uh, work, still not completed, but I think it's worthwhile mentioning these things because these are all moving in the right direction, you see, in terms of a web-based portal, which make all cross-border trade regulatory information available. And I, I can see lots of things, laws, prohibitions, restrictions, technical standards, commodity classifications, tariffs, license permits, applications, clearances, everything coming. And as this came in, the one thing that surprised me of how many are there. I mean, that's the problem. You see, we, we take the existing things and we generally digitize them, but that really won't solve the problem. We had 788 of these. We were only second to Vietnam, which had about 1,500 but then Vietnam is not our benchmark on these. So we have much to be done, but uh, the reason I mentioned it is at least we are going in the right direction, right? So uh, then we have to, we, 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 we have to, we, 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 I would also quickly want to mention that the, the, about the free trade agreements. I know free trade agreements are not going to immediately increase your exports, but it is going in the direction of reform. You know that we have uh, the Indo Lanka free trade agreement. Ten rounds of discussions have been held. More than 4,000 product lines are now duty free into India. We have gained from the original Indo Lanka free trade agreement more than India has because they keep exporting outside the agreement, whether we had the agreement or not. We have been increasing our exports all the time. There's so much misinformation about these or the bad experience of a few people sometimes overshadow the larger picture for, for the country. And therefore, ITCA is going to be actually expanding the scope. The biggest, the, the biggest scope that we expanded was in our Singapore free trade agreement, where we went into services, investment, and economic cooperation. It's also a strategic move to look east, our traditional markets in the US and Europe, but we have to begin to look east. While we also take the point that Arun made more integration with South Asia. I, I, I don't have time, so I won't get into all those details, but maybe I'll just close there and uh, we'll go into the discussion and maybe I can clarify more. Thank you again for inviting me to be here this morning. Thank you, Minister Ron. I think we got um, Frank sort of replies to some of the queries and also some of the views uh, in terms of the other issues as well. Um, for the two panelists, I think what we'll do is we'll do a, I'll maybe do an initial two rounds of questions to the panelists and then um, see a lot of questions coming in through the app. So keep them coming um, and let me curate it and um, ask them with the panelists as well. Um, to the two panelists who've not spoken as yet, I think Asoka and, and Dr. Nishan, I think um, we are hearing um, in, in terms of some of the macro indicators, uh, a more stable economy uh, in terms of some of the numbers but we're also seeing it in the backdrop of these external risks as described in the presentations. Um, we're seeing corporate earnings, though concerns are there, still growing, uh, if you look at it from a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis or in terms of a year on, uh, the, you know, the 12 months uh, preceding it. Um, but we're seeing private sector sentiment um, declining. Um, if you look at various indicators, it's, it's showing a, a decline. Sentiment overall is negative. What is the real, why are we seeing this divergence, do you think? And is it part of this economic turnaround or are we in that stage where it's at the bottom and we're rising up or at what point of this cycle are we at? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think if when we look at the topic, economic turnaround, how and when, then we are all uh, assuming that we are not doing that, right? So probably that is uh, my starting point. Uh, let me give a view on the domestic economy, uh, essentially the retail trade. But the retail trade is important because retail trade is vast. From the grocery store in a village 
to the supermarket or the shop in the mall. And from the normal groceries, right up to FMCG products and consumer durables, jewelry, furniture, things like that. I think it is also an important sector because the domestic economy and the retail sector reflects the income of the consumer. And I think Honorable Minister will appreciate also the income of the voter. So it is an important thing, especially uh, for those in the government as well as those in the opposition. And very frequently, uh, I'm asked by many members of the government, as well as many members of the opposition, how is the retail sector doing? Uh, because that reflects the income of the consumer. Let me look at it uh, in a couple of things. What are the shortcomings or the issues that we had, which are now being rectified? What are the shortcomings which are yet to be rectified? And what are the new positives that are there? And what are the existing positives that will continue? Uh, looking at the negative factors, I think the Honorable Minister uh, got it right when he said the biggest impact was the drop in the harvest and the drought. For three consecutive uh, harvests were affected, that, if, that about 30% of the population is engaged in, the, in some form of agriculture. And therefore, that made the biggest impact in the domestic economy. So we are hoping that the, it is behind us, that the weather patterns have changed from a drought to a rain, and therefore that we would be better in the coming months. Uh, if you look at the harvest in April, it was better. Harvest in September, also better. Uh, rains have to though come in October, and that will only dictate whether there will be a good harvest uh, in March, April, which is the biggest harvesting season. So we are hoping, keeping our fingers crossed, that the weather would be okay. The second area where there is, I would say, improvement is in the implementation of the projects. Because we see the government uh, implementing some of the projects that two years ago, we were complaining that nothing is happening. Something is happening. I don't think the entire private sector is fully satisfied, but something is happening. I was looking at the, uh, uh, all the development that was reported in Poland Naru, 100 programs or something. The speed at which it was done, the extent at which it was done, and if the government can do things at that speed, at that extent, then I'm sure that would be a major turnaround. Uh, also, I think the state-owned enterprises, unproductive, go unproductive government expenditure. I must say that uh, unproductive government expenditure is probably stopped. And that is something that people don't realize. And uh, Possibly, uh, in fairness to the government, uh, lots of unproductive expenses using borrowed funds has stopped. It's probably a major gain on the part of the government, which probably is not appreciated by the general public. So those are areas where we see the negative factors being, uh, we see progress on some of the uh, negative factors. If you look at the factors that are yet to be corrected. Uh, let me highlight about two of them, because lots of people, other people have highlighted some of them, and some are long term. Uh, first is the negative perception. Now, anybody who runs a marketing company knows perception is greater than reality. And that is a fact. So yes, Things can be improved, but the perception of where we are is the perception is much bad, much worse than what it actually is. And I think 
the let me give an ex, uh, uh, example uh, of something that happened last week one of our staff members came and told me and the uh, maybe the uh, foreign guests would uh, bear with me if i express it in singhala because it is more relevant he asked me he said sir me arthike okkoma kadang wetena neda me dollar e yana vidiyata so i asked him hey then he said ape aadayama taduwe ape wiyadamat wedi we then i said dollar ekak wedi unahama wiyadama samahara vita imported items wala wiyadama wedi wenawa namuth aadayama adu wenna adu wenna vidiyanne nah i said then export industry ke inne kenek innawa nan ती रबर कर गार्मेंट वाले इन्ना आएगे एक आदाय में वैरी होना टूरिज्म वाले इन्ना आएगे आदाय में वैरी होना ये वाक पिटराटी साली हम कट्टी इन्ना एक आदाय में वैरी होना सो सो देन आई एक्सप्लेन इट एंड देन ही वॉज ओके बट द जनरल पर्सेप्शन इज द डॉलर इज गोइंग अप एंड द होल इकोनॉमी विल क्रैश एंड दैट्स अ नेगेटिव परसेप्शन एज फार एज आई रिमेंबर फ्रॉम नाइनटीन सेवेंटी सेवन द डॉलर इज गोइंग अप and i if i remember the first thing that uh, president jr jayawardena did of course we were in school but he devalued the currency so i don't see devaluation as a bad thing although i run a company which imports lot of products for us if the government holds on to the dollar try to hold on for to it for a long period as it happened twice before in 2012 and 2015 if they try to hold it too for too long and then they release it then the economy the domestic markets run into chaos but if there is gradual depreciation it devalues by 5% whereas the interest rate is about 12% that's perfectly in order and you would edge up prices 1% half a percent and the economy the domestic market is totally unaffected the second other factor which is there uh, is the uh, job creation i think uh, there are jobs we don't have problem about job creation we have underemployment in specific sectors and a huge demand in the other sectors and we may need a strategy to shift people from this underemployment to where the employment is now what is happening is these people are underemployed they are not working their full potential they are not earning their full potential the economy is not productive to the full uh, potential and then they sit and blagad everybody that the, they don't earn enough so all what we need to do is to shift these guys to where the jobs are there are almost 100000 jobs i think where there are vacancies hotel sector retail sector construction sector garment sector so many areas so i think those are some of the areas i would also say one of the other things that is a new positive factor is the enterprise sri lanka which was done by the government again uh, i would say it has given a little bit of spirit in the rural areas uh, to say we can go into business we can get some loans and we go, can go into business and we can do that i'm not sure what the reality is whether in reality it's making a big impact but as i told you perception is greater than reality as long as people believe this is doing great for us then then that is positive i think that sums up the perception part of this economic turn around and maybe the sentiment as well dr nishan Thank you Shiran. I'm going to try and keep it a little shorter because I know you want to ask many questions. This is a topic on which I think we we have hours worth of things to say. Uh but just to focus on the question of turnaround, we ask ourselves the question well turnaround from what? Uh I think that's what Asoka also asked. When you look back from 1977 at our economy, you realize that we've been growing at an average rate of about 5%. but sometimes we are growing a little more even a lot more other times we are growing a little less even a lot less and we get that average but we don't get it steadily we get it in a oscillating form so really i think the question is for today 
uh, whether we are still in that historical cycle, and you use the term cycle, or are we on a new trajectory of economic growth? Are we simply moving in a part of a cycle, in which case we have to understand which part of the cycle we are in? And that is the million dollar question. Uh, have we done something to significantly change our trajectory, or do we see ourselves moving around in the same cycles that we have moved in the past? And it's not just the economy that moves in cycles, as you know. Uh, the politicians and political parties, they come and they go. Reform initiatives tend to come and go with those political parties and the politicians. And, you know, the IMF also comes and it goes. Uh, we've had, what, I think, maybe 17 IMF programs in 35 years or something like that. It's, I can't remember the number. So really, I Sri Lanka seems to be very good at living inside a repetitive cycle. And I think it's very important to ask the question, are we in a new trajectory? Now, in the, you know, in the, in the dark humor of Spanish in the streets of Sao Paulo in Brazil, there's a very popular phrase about that the people say, uh, used to say about Brazil. They said, you know, Brazil is a country of the future. And it always will be. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we keep telling ourselves that we are on the cusp of an economic turnaround. And we always, are, is it true that we always will be? Okay, because I have seen this conversation since the mid-90s when I started working for the government and the president and all that, uh, where we are always on the cusp of a new trajectory. Uh, now, I don't want to be pessimistic. I want us to be on that trajectory, but I think in that case, we have to understand what the challenge is. And the challenge, I think, is, a, I can put it this way, whether we are on a new trajectory, on a new cycle, depends on the kind of change or reform that we attempt. Is it structural or is it superficial? The superficial changes will keep us moving back and forth in the cycle because it is so easy to use monetary policy to pump up growth. It's so easy to use fiscal expansion to pump up growth. And we use the IMF also to fix the problem every now and then when we have it. And we can keep going in that cycle. Uh, or we think we can change our political parties and political leaders and solve the problem. But these are a kind of a, a group of superficial macro, large, leverage uh, instruments that we're using. We don't look at the micro-institutional fixes that are structural that this country desperately needs. Let me give you a couple of examples. Agriculture productivity. 28% of our labor force say they're in agriculture. They percent produce 8% of GDP. Can we take all of them and move them to services and industry and solve the problem? No way. People don't move that fast. Economies don't change that fast. We have to make agriculture more productive. The simplest thing in doing that is we know that post-harvest loss in this country ranges from about 18% to about 42%, depending on the product. And getting a system of plastic crates working in the movement of agriculture products, which most countries around us have done, uh, can significantly improve agriculture productivity just in terms of delivery we are not able to get that simple thing done. And nobody's focused on it. It's a simple micro change that's structural that can make an enormous difference. Uh, we imagine, just like we imagine that we can ignore agriculture and move to industry and services and solve the problem, we th think we can ignore the public sector and that the private sector can solve our problem. But everybody in the private sector tells me that the public sector is the bottleneck. It's what impedes them from moving. Eteri talked about an aging population, but every time a politician wants a competent public servant, they look for someone who's retired and above 70. <laughs> the president's secretary included who just resigned. Okay, so really our most productive public uh, servants, I, and we're glad they're living to a ripe old age because we need them because we have replaced a competent public sector with a much less competent one, uh, with lower capacity and crippling levels of corruption. 
uh, that is actually hurting simple reforms. Why did we Sri Lanka not have electronic signatures implemented till last year when the law to do that was in place as early as 2006? And the conversation to do that was in place since 1994. Why does it take 20 odd years to get such a simple change done, a structural change that immediately releases efficiency and productivity? And it's the same thing. We want these large instruments of trade agreements and trade, you know, negotiating problems at other people's borders. But all our research tells us that most of the problems that exporters have is in our own country, in our own border, in our own processes, in our own institutional mechanisms. And even when we negotiate those agreements, you know, we don't have the capacity to negotiate them smart. Why is it that we have not benefited very much from the Indian free trade agreement, it's because the most benefit that is to be had is in food products, which India puts a tax of almost 100% to everyone else and we are zero rated. But it gets held up in ports for checking. Uh, we don't have what's called a mutual recognition with uh, agreement with India, which India has with Singapore, other countries, and is a common trade instrument that allows the testing done in Sri Lanka to be accepted in the Indian port so actually our exporters and from John Keels to the smallest straw strawberries uh, to Jagro, they all say that ultimately they get hit in the Indian port and all the clauses of our trade agreement are useless without an MRA. And, and the funny thing is we've given Indian, India and institutions the right and accreditation to test for our standards. We just haven't asked for reciprocity or mutuality. So these are just a few examples. I can go on for half a day with the research that we've done on these kinds of issues, that it's not just the devil that's in the details. If the devil's in the details, God is in the details also. Uh, and we have got to start thinking differently about the kind of quick fixes that we ha can gen do to generate high, uh, uh, higher growth and higher satisfaction so that politicians can be re-elected, Iran. Uh, to the kind of institutional structural changes that take a little patience, perseverance, and are tough but need to be tackled. Or let's talk about not a turnaround, but turning around and around. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nishan. So in the interest of time, I think the next few rounds of questions will be taken from the app, and we'll make it a bit brief. But just following up on some of the questions we're getting here as well, uh, Minister Iran, in terms of we've recognized this turnaround and we recognize that the cycle needs to be broken. Um, there are quick fixes in place, but that stability can easily be lost in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, questions here are in terms of uh, a lot of the reforms has focused on improving revenue, but maybe rationalization of expenditure, I know Asoka touched on it as well. Um, how do those kind of things move forward and what are some of the priorities in executing some of these reforms that Nishan was talking about? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> actually, there are so many things that need to be done. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, which ones do you actually go ahead with? Uh, so some of the things that we have been looking at were uh, more to do with like energy reforms, uh, things like that, that need to be done. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, I'm sure there is space to uh, look at uh, some reforms on expenditure, but uh, I'm struggling hard to find a lot of wasteful expenditure. Uh, how do you roll back the social welfare state? You see, uh, you know, you get a free education, you go to university, you hold a board, you get a government job, you retire, you get a pension, uh, and then the only thing you don't uh, contribute to is the Marana Dara Samitya. But otherwise, everything you contribute to. So how do you actually uh, do that? Uh, and is it possible to do that, given also, though somebody said that Sri Lanka ranks better on the inequality than past of Asia, I, I don't myself agree with that. 
You see, I, I think that the inequalities have widened and uh, something needs to be done uh, to actually lessen it. And even the Inland Revenue Bill, one of the objectives of it was to make sure that social inequality, uh, justice, social justice through the taxation system is achieved. We may not be seeing the results immediately, but we want to see those kinds of things achieved. If you look at the public expenditure program, from the highs of seven, we are really close to four, right? And uh, on the public expenditure, uh, that's having some implications in terms of growth, for sure. I think the public expenditure program should be higher, right? Uh, and then our strategy was expecting the private sector to fill the uh, gap that hasn't happened at the pace we are expecting it to do. So if the Sri Lankan private sector doesn't lead with that, then naturally foreign direct investment basically follows that, and therefore there has been a gap there. So uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying something general here uh, about reforms. Um, um, and if there's something very specific, maybe I can answer. The other point is also in terms of, I think, um, communication in this turnaround. And I think you mentioned we're in a coalition government, but also what you're also seeing, communication on three funds, policy rationale. So, for example, the introduction of the fuel pricing mechanism, um, communication of that, and then maybe a further, I don't know, declaration of what the formula is so that the general public can understand. The other is communication when taking the decision. And uh, you also mentioned, I mean, coalition government, but uh, you will get diverse views. But even within parties, if I may put, you do get uh, diverse views coming out. So how does the private sector then interpret these kind of policy signals? Because that is also bearing on sentiment, that is also bearing on this predictability that the private sector is looking for. Yeah, so uh, uh, certainly, uh, um, uh, you know, speaking with more than one voice doesn't help the private sector, for sure, because that looks like a contradiction. Uh, the other thing is uh, shocks don't help investment and the private sector, particularly in terms of policy, in terms of tax, you know, and so forth and so on. Um, this is a little anecdote. So I came in midstream when the new Inland Revenue Bill was already in the making. And uh, then the idea was to basically implement it soon after the bill had been passed. And I came with my private sector background and make this big noise and said, we can't do it like that. We have to put a forward date. It must be on the next, basically, uh, you know, date, the, you know, the tax year, 1st April 2018. Uh, and now it's four months later, and uh, all my political politicians, my fellow MPs and all look at me and said to me, you are still learning. So I said, why? They said, you see, so, so uh, I, I, I agree that uh, we must create more certainty. We must, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in our plans, they're giving too many shocks, you know, and there are, uh, I think the point that was said was of us more to do with implementation, not just policy. Uh, and I took that point when uh, I think Arun made that point in his speech. Uh, there are certainly implementation issues, lots of hiccups on implementation. Uh, every week we are seeing some of the implementation problems, right, that are coming up. Uh, this leaves a ish problem even to me. Uh, for long, people have said, uh, you know, you have to have separation of government, the, you know, the legislature must be independent from the executive, the judiciary must be independent, and I'm trying to practice all these theories, and then I'm saying I'm a politician, I'm a minister, don't interfere with the central bank, the CEO of the finance ministry is the secretary of the finance ministry, they have to run the administration and all that, then I come to the seminars and I hear, but you have a problem in your implementation, get it fixed. Right? Right. So public sector reform, I think with the next mandate, the new president's number one, in my view, number one, number one objective for the new president with a mandate has to be public sector reform. Sri Lanka has nearly 1.4 million, 1.4 million, that is in the public sector and in the defense forces. I had lunch with the Japanese defense minister the other day. I asked him, how many public servants do you have in Japan? He said, in the central government, 600. 
I said, how many in the defense forces? 250. What's the total? 850. I said, do you want to know my number? He said, yes. I said, 1.4 million. I said, our population is 21, and your population is 120 million. You see? So we are, we are uh, in reforms when we are talking, is we are talking of putting plasters all over the place, you see? But that is a major reform, the single biggest reform that will have to be undertaken, because if we don't undertake that reform, we need a new constitution. The moment you use the word constitution, people think that's something to do with the war in the North. We need a new constitution because we just need to say we have 25 ministries and no more. These are the ministries. They are, they are defined in the constitution. No political leader in this country should be given any discretion, any discretion to decide what the ministries of this country are because they have failed us for 70 years. Why should we give them that? We should put it in the constitution. We should have annexures. We should even go ahead and put the institutions in the annexures of what the institution should be there. You see, we need certainty. But I'm, what I'm saying is we are looking at plasters. We have to do some fundamental things at the top if you really want to see this country progress. I know I diverted, but I have yeah, wanted sure. to make that point. Covered a, a few other questions as well. Um, Arun, let me bring you into this conversation as well. And the global risk that Terry and uh, Anubhuti was highlighting is very common to India as well. And I think as much as we are seeing the rupee depreciate 5 6% this year so far, India has seen above 10% um, weakness in its currency. How is India preparing um, for this external risk? And what can maybe Sri Lanka learn off, off of it? So I think on the uh, rupee depreciation in particular, there are really two narratives. One is a narrative I hear from business people, which says, let's look at this as an opportunity to increase exports and get more competitive. And that, in fact, is a predominant narrative that I hear in the business circles. Now, there's a more public narrative, which is, a, I'd say, a political narrative that su somehow suggests that the weakening of the rupee has got something to do with the performance of the government. Whereas, as was pointed out earlier today, there are many things that happen globally that affect a currency. So I, I have not seen any sense of um, alarm at the depreciation. Yes, the fact that uh, fuel prices have gone up is an issue of concern. Um, but overall, I would say there's been a pretty balanced reaction in India to, to that particular topic. Uh, just to add on uh, you know, uh, that, uh, I think a very important point which Mr. Arun men mentioned was that despite rupee weakening to, uh, you know, we have never seen rupee at uh, these levels, uh, there is no panic in the uh, government. And to, and at, at the same time, when it comes to fuel prices, the um, minister was talking about, uh, you know, politicians facing constraints. India is going for elections in 2019. And as an economist, I really would like to commend the government world because they are not buckling up under pressure. They have been passing on whatever the price increases have happened globally uh, to the public. And every day uh, at primetime shows, we constantly see this debate that probably this government is not doing the right thing, but uh, they have stuck to their guns. In terms of what India is doing in order to manage uh, the sharp depreciation in rupee, I think the first important point was that they are not panicking. Uh, that makes a lot of difference because at times if government policy makers take very quick action, it panics the market further. Uh, secondly, uh, they are focusing a lot on macroeconomic stability. So containing inflation, containing fiscal deficit, allowing the central bank to go and raise rates uh, in order to uh, you know, protect some kind of uh, outflows. Uh, that still uh, continues. The other part, and uh, there probably we will have to wait a little more uh, to get some more clarity in terms of raising uh, more uh, dollars. So recently there have been talks, especially coming from government, that probably we can see a few more measures in order to raise a uh, dollar to shore up our FX reserves, not for rainy day. India has very comfortable uh, FX reserves, you know, nine months of import cover. Uh, but as I mentioned in my presentation, Probably, as policymakers and as risk managers, we all need to prepare for a stormy day. And that is where this whole debate about raising more dollars, despite having nine months of import covers, is coming up uh, very frequently in India. 
you know, since we were on the topic of India, I wanted to make one point which really builds on the minister's com comments about implementation. You know, in India, one I, I've been struck by the very loud and strong narrative about reform. So about whether it's a goods and services tax or the insolvency and bankruptcy code, which by the way is a very important reform. I think there's a strong narrative that says, you know, these are the things that the government is doing and bureaucracies, everybody, you know, really get behind it. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar enough to know, but I, I, I've been seeing that that is quite an important element of bringing about change, especially in a large country with so many states, etc. Um, but the force of the narrative is, is quite important. Uh, moving into, I guess, the other part of the discussion is on getting growth back on track. Um, any views across uh, the table in terms of, yes, we're heading into potentially an election cycle. We could see um, certain maybe um, things added to stimulate consumption. But going back to your point, that won't really break the cycle and we're going to go in circles once again. What, what can be be done to sort of maybe stimulate growth in a more sustainable manner? I think uh, to stimulate growth, uh, there are, I mean, lots of plans that have been made to make Sri Lanka a hub. And I think that's the way we need to do, to implement the plans. Because we have, I think, sufficient plans now. <laughs> so it's a matter of implementation of it. Uh, from the uh, retailer's point of view, let me say, uh, what we have actually lo uh, lobbied for is to make Sri Lanka a retail hub because we are in a position to do that. And I think uh, last year I had an experience when we coordinated the, uh, one of the campaigns with the government. By the time the government uh, agency ticked every box of the bureaucracy, half of the pro promotional period was gone. <laughs> so. So we need to speed up that implementation. Uh, I think earlier this week, the Honorable Minister and the uh, uh, Minister of State uh, opened the VAT refund for tourists, which was also part of the uh, things that uh, the retailers were pushing for. So I think like that, the whole making Sri Lanka a hub, a port hub, an airport hub, a retail hub, a tourist hub, a hospitality hub, educational hub, those plans are there. It's, I think uh, we need to implement those. Dr. Thierry, on some of the growth. Thank you very much. Um, to reflect on a couple of me points mentioned here, especially IMF's role, um, yes, it's 16th program in Sri Lanka since 1965. So yes, IMF programs come and go. I think what's different about this program First of all, it's three years, and it actually aims to achieve this long-term structural issues, which were left untackled because somehow IMF was always needed here for a year, maximum 18 months, just to put fast patches on crisis management and move on. And there was no appetite to actually go deep and address main structural problems. like. Writing the law, getting it approved, getting into implementation, you cannot do it in six to 12 months. Um, especially in the democratic and coalition setup, you need to build consensus, you need to convince everybody that the, it's the right thing to do. So again, this program as well, I, you can't have it for 10 years, right? It just gives you opportunity to lay the foundation and then it's up to people of this country, what can they build on this foundation? In terms of uh, growth uh, opportunities, I think everybody in this room agrees that competition, innovation, reducing regulatory burden is the key. And I think Minister Iran went to the point of bureaucracy and role of the public sector. One thing that always kind of surprises me here is that whenever you have a problem, solution is somehow just another co uh, commission or another institution or another agency. And 
there are so many agencies, there are so many strategies that uh, it's very hard to do, to do anything in this kind of configuration. I think response should be less regulations and less institutions. And um, point of automation, like if you take an existing systems and try to automate, uh, it's not a response, it's just more automatic platforms on top of manual systems. Uh, where I think more effort is needed is consolidating and streamlining institutional processes, getting rid of unnecessary regulations and paperwork, and then automating those systems. And some of these reforms have been done successfully and were key for unlocking doing business environment. So that's where I think Sri Lanka's next growth platform and next growth path is. Yeah. So thank you. I think I spoke um, previously about government. Let me speak a little bit about private sector. Uh, because this is a private sector forum, uh, and the private sector has an important role to play. Uh, I think as a private sector, uh, and it's natural, uh, most companies in Sri Lanka have learned the art of surviving in a broken system. This is a special skill that people have, right? Uh, and most policymakers and researchers also have this art of surviving in a broken system. And the IMF knows the art of surviving in a broken system in Sri Lanka because they not only have to write the law, they have to write the manual to say how to implement the law, they have to edit that manual uh, and probably print it and, and, and distribute it as well, right? Because we have a broken system. Uh, and when you survive in a broken system, it's a little like surviving in a gorilla community. The normal rules don't apply and you try to be the first, you try to be the biggest gorilla. Uh, and then you can manipulate the political gorillas, right? And, and you build the system to work just for you as a company uh, and as a group of companies. But really, we have the classic prisoner's dilemma problem. You all know what the prisoner's dilemma is, right? It's when everyone works for their own self-interest, actually their own self-interest is ultimately undermined. Uh, you have to find a collective way of fixing or moving towards fixing the system, or there is really no other way to solve it. I mean, I've discussed this with leaders of the private sector. We all fund politicians. And we fund the kind of politicians that are going to do what we want. And then we complain that the political system is not working. Because we don't fund politicians like Iran, seriously. Right? These are, uh, and I can, it's not just him, I can name several very good politicians or parliamentarians. These are not the people that the private sector puts a lot of money behind. And then we wonder what happened to our country, to our laws, to our implementation, to our bureaucracy, uh, and we are surprised. So I think there is a reflective step back for the private sector also here. Uh, it's, not it's not something that politicians or parliamentarians alone can solve. Uh, it has to be something that we do together. Uh, because bureaucrats that can be manipulated, politicians that can be manipulated, it takes two hands to clap are working very well together with private sector that has learned to survive in this broken system. So it's like, just like ordinary citizen who can't get their kid into a decent school, who can't access government jobs because they are in the broken system, the politicians have broken the system and become gatekeepers. And so this citizen has learned to work the broken system. If you ask any parliamentarian what happens on, 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 on public day on Wednesday, people come with chits and letters to sign to get a job to get their ch ch child into school, uh, to actually work this broken system in a broken way. But I think we have to wake up and say, that's not the art, the art of survival that we have learned isn't going to get us where we want to go. It's just going to keep us here where we are. And we have then come together and say, how do we actually pick up systemic change and, and work towards that in a more concerted way? It means also a change of values and commitments uh, that we, we, we have to take a step back and think about. I'll pause because I, I don't want to take up all your time. Mm. 
Minister Iran, if I can end the session uh, with you in terms of the remarks you're hearing, in terms of the broken system, the turnaround, growth, um, what is really going to be really feasible in the next 12 to 18 months? What can the private sector look forward to in terms of what government will deliver on? I think you're going to be disappointed with my answer because you're moving more and more to the next quarter and you expanded it by talking about six quarters rather than one quarter. Uh, and I'm, I'm determined to say we need to take a longer look and not really succumb to the pressure and keep to the path that we have really set forth in going forward. Uh, my friends call me up often and say, Iran, uh, I can help you. You know, so many people come to see you because they're looking for jobs. If you can send 100 people, I'll employ them. And uh, I can't find the 100 people who want to go and join the private sector. We are near full employment, point fully taken about underemployment, but we are near full employment, right? And we don't have the people to actually send. Mangala Samaravira, the finance minister, came up with a really, a, I think it was a really a good, good concept that was called Enterprise Sri Lanka. And Asoka referred to it, and I'm not referring to the loan schemes under Enterprise Sri Lanka. I have lots of concerns about the loan schemes. I have lots of concerns about the implementation. But I want to just underscore this point, that when 10 people, young people, come to see me on Saturday at my open day, not at the ministry, in my electorate, right? They will come and they will give me their CVs. They will say, we want a job. Those young people don't know, neither do their parents know, that this is probably one of the few countries in the world or the only country in the world that you think your local MP is the job bank. And you come and they're serious. They come and they think that I can get them. If I can get them a job, I'm re-elected. If I can't get them a job, there's something wrong with you. You see, because you don't know how to work the system. So they come, I feel sorry for them, I feel sorry for their parents, right? What have we created? We have created a dependency culture. A dependency culture. Enterprise Sri Lanka, the, the thinking behind it is to break the dependency culture. It is about telling young people, you know, you don't only have to have a job, you can be more than that, right? Iran Vikramaratna heads a bank, a new car is parked under his porch, the neighbors get together, they're talking in their home, and they say, my heavens, Iran must be climbing the ladder in the bank. He's got a new car. Few days later, the neighbor gets a new car, other neighbors are meeting in the home, they know he's a businessman, they are saying, kohumada danne hambu ne. I'm not joking. I'm just using these anecdotes because they really tell you a story. Our mother, our grandmother told us, be a doctor, engineer, lawyer, banker, some professional, that's the benchmark. Anything else is less. Somebody comes with an entrepreneurial idea, right? That's what they said. So we have, a, we have an issue, a value issue. It's entrepreneurs who create value. It's entrepreneurs who create jobs but our society does not give them that value. On enterprise Sri Lanka is to break from the dependency culture, to put entrepreneurship back on the map. It's to tell young people who have ideas. Loan schemes can't solve this, because we all know businessmen, we need debt and equity, and therefore lots of gaps in the program, lots of hiccups. Bankers don't take the risk that we want them to take on project finance. What the government can do is limited. I accept all of that, but I'm just saying, that our issues, right, I, I don't want to give short-term answers. I really think we need to take a long term. We need to tackle the attitudinal matrices. We need to tackle the values. We need to stick, stick to sustainable economic policies, right, sustainable economic policies. We need to get through it. If we get through once, it will be reversible. Right. So on, <laughs> on that note, I think we've run out of time. So. Let's put one more round of applause for all the panelists and presenters of this first session and we hope this conversation will move forward. We've answered a few of the burning questions in terms of the turnaround. Some questions are still left open. Let's hope some of the other sessions will provide those answers. Uh, to provide a, 
a moment of, of our appreciation to um, uh, our panelists. Could we get, um, yeah. We'll be now breaking um, for a short uh, tea break and you can once again start with the second session at 11.30.